On behalf of Nameda Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Team Vocats, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. Our magazine partner for this series is the week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Even as we've completed over 110 episodes with 3.4 million views or thereabouts, it is our endeavor to replace some of our very special sections, which you may have missed as part of this ongoing series, JLF Brave New World's Redux. Our second session for the day is Otto Lenghi's Lockdown Kitchen. With his fabulous restaurants and best-selling Otto Lenghi cookbooks, Yotam Otto Lenghi has established himself as one of the most exciting talents in the world of cookery and food writing. Not a vegetarian himself, his approach to vegetable dishes is wholly original and innovative based on strong flavors and stunning fresh combinations. Here he talks to award-winning food writer and chef Ravinder Bhogal about his life and work and what we should be doing uh, in terms of cooking to keep sane during the lockdown. Yotam Otolangi is a cookery writer and chef patron of the Otolangi Delis, Poppy and Rovi, restaurants. He writes a weekly column in the Guardian's Feast magazine, a monthly column in the New Yorker, and has published seven best-selling cookbooks. His 2018 award-winning book is Otto Lenghi Simple with Tara Wigley and Esma Howard. His latest cookbook, Flavor, will be published in September 2020. <clears throat> Ravinder Bhogal is an award-winning journalist, restauranter, chef, and broadcaster. In 2016, she opened her first restaurant, Shikoni, gaining a place in the National Restaurant Awards within six months of opening. Her debut book, Cook in Boots, won the Gooman World Cookbook Award for the UK's best first cookbook. Her latest book is Shikoni, proudly inauthentic recipes from an immigrant's kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, Ravinder Bhokal and Yotam Otolenghi, Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section. Do also follow our handle GLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. And in case any of you drop off due to bad bandwidth issues, or in case we drop off, we promise to be back. Or you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest GLF, or of course, on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, Otto Lenghi's Lockdown Kitchen. Hi, Yotam. It's so lovely to see you. Good to see you too, Ravinder. It's a, it's a special occasion. Welcome uh, to the Jaipur Literary Festival in my humble dining room. <laughs> <laughs> far, far away from the magnificent palaces of Jaipur. How was your commute to your living room? <laughs> it was very easy. Uh, but I was on the phone with a friend and I said, you know what we are doing now? I'm going to the Jaipur Literary Festival. She said, lucky you. And um, yeah, all I had to move is from the bed to the uh, to this corner of the room to uh, to do this, which is kind of magical. But believe me, I would have much rather be to Jaipur right now. <laughs> me too. Well, hopefully when lockdown is over, one day we'll be in Jaipur doing this. Yeah. I'm so thrilled. You know, I'm a huge, huge Otolenghi fan, um, you know, and I'm just so utterly thrilled to be chatting to you today. You know, you don't need an introduction, uh, but in case anybody has been living under a rock for the past 20 years, I'll go ahead and introduce you anyway. And I've got my papers, I'm feeling very official. So, you I don't blush too much. Oh, <laughs> Yokomoto Lengi is the undisputed king of cookery one of the most influential chefs of our times and someone I am hugely personally indebted to because over the years I have found so much inspiration in your time in reading your columns, your books, um, reading your recipes, cooking them and of course eating at your stunning restaurants. You have really revolutionized how we cook, how we shop and how we eat and you have introduced us to the rich poetry of Levantine cuisine and its wonderful ingredients. You have been um, an invisible guest at countless very happy dinner parties through all your wonderful recipes. 
and you've seduced us with the most decadent and magical displays of food in your delis. I mean, I, I, I remember seeing my first Otolenghi deli and I just stopped. I was just wonderstruck in, in the window. Um, and, and now you're even shaping popular culture because you've been name dropped on television sitcoms and recently you've even had a song written about you. And in fact, I was so inspired by the song. I've actually written a poem about you. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I couldn't find anything to rhyme with Ottolenghi. But if I was going to compose a sonnet, it would certainly be about you because you are wonderful. Um, but now my gushing is done. Should we get on with uh, talking about lockdown cookery? Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> You're please. gushing just a little bit. Um, but so firstly, how are you and your family, how are you faring in this crazy lockdown? Um, well, I think just like everybody else, it's, uh, it's, um, it's come out of the blue. Nobody you know, in, this, in this world has planned for this or her. And we, um, Carl, my husband and I have been uh, kind of shocked to have uh, been uh, under lockdown. We have two young boys, Max yeah. and Flynn, they're five, four years old and, se and a seven-year-old. Um, so it's it's quite a lot. It's very special because we got a lot of time with our kids, yeah. um, but it's also exhausting because in between, you know, educating, cooking, cleaning, working, you you just you just have very little time left, and you end up you end the day absolutely exhausted. And I just think one of the uh, symptoms of this time is the uh, is the uh, is the fact that the, we're all slightly disorientated, we're all slightly unfocused. And I feel this very much in my mind. I'm constantly pulled and pushed in different direction because you can't go to work. You can't kind of apply yourself properly to one yeah. thing. Um, but it is a magical time. And, and one of the things that I have to say that I've noticed that is just so uh, clear and, um, and ex almost exciting about this moment is that we stop to think about things that we haven't thought about before or haven't thought about for a long time. From my perspective, it's what are we cooking? Uh, there seems to be this explosion of, of cookery going on because, and I've thought about it, why is it that everybody cooks at the moment when they're stuck at home? And, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. We, we, you know, we go back to domestic habits that we've kind of left behind in kind of modern societies because these things are done for us by people like you and me, you know, with their restaurant owners or supermarkets, you know, serving meals, etc. But it's actually quite nice to go back and people have been relearning skills, uh, either learning or relearning skills. A lot that of they have lost or, <laughs> or have, you know, sourdough or mayonnaise or chili sauce or a hundred things that, you know, that they've, they're, um, you know, searching on their phones to find out how do I make this, how do I do this. That's been very special. I was, I, I feel very, like, very um, happy to be involved in this. In our house, uh, yeah, we also cook. It's a lovely way to punctuate the day because you know you don't have the normal ways to kind of set out the day. But breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as they've been kind of going on for generations and and, and years. Are, are back you know we wake up in the morning we have to do something we're going to have our breakfast and then our lunch normally we're not together during lunchtime so we've been doing lots of lots of cooking you know with the ki kids you know there was uh, we've uh, introduced the Sunday roast which is really not something that we've been doing in our family because uh, normally on Sunday we're out we go to see friends or we go to a museum or we you know the kids and out in the park all of a sudden we're stuck in the house so we're having a Sunday roast with lots of lovely vegetables and, you know, and, uh, or the, it was Easter, we did hot cross buns and, you know, all those kind of things that busy life in a city just doesn't allow you. So we have, we have been re exploring the kitchen ourselves all the time. And yeah. even today, just now, you know, before we've, just, I got on this conversation with you, I decided oh, I want to do something different for the kids and uh, something that will happen. So I'm obviously very child focused at the moment, and I did this pot of chicken and pasta, all cooked in one in one pot, which and then put it on the grill to get the pasta to crisp up. Which reminds me of something my dad used to make me for me, like crispy pasta. Uh, yeah. But it's really nice. Like I thought, oh, what can I do for them to that I know they're absolutely going to love and. 
when you cook chicken and pasta in one pot and put the water in to, 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 for the pasta to cook, it kind of absorbs it, but it also absor absorbs the, the chicken flavors at the yeah. same time, you know, like mm -hmm. chicken and rice or chicken and, uh, with, uh, with uh, orzo but it looks great and so yeah it's like every day there's a little discovery my next question because i'm so nosy i'd love to know what what you were having for dinner tonight but i'll ask you what do you, what have you been eating for your breakfast because breakfast is we actually have time to have breakfast these days you know all these uh you know it's a it's a really sorrowful time but there are these silver linings like being able to spend time with your family and 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 to cook and to do all these lovely things that you don't normally have time for so what does breakfast consist of in the otto lenghi household <laughs> um it changes quite a lot so um carl and i are not massive breakfast eaters like we love to eat breakfast on the weekend or brunches but it's a little bit more about the kids i've been making this morning i i made them a welsh rare bit uh, so i had a lot of i defrosted the freezer so i had these sliced sourdough bread that i I had to use that, so I took uh, uh, some grated uh, cheddar and I mixed it up with some Worcester sauce and egg and and, um, and a bit of powdered mustard, and put it. I toasted the uh, the bread with a bit of, and then put some butter and then put that under the grill, and they had that with a fried egg. They were very happy. And we always say that they don't know how lucky they are because we we are really making such effort to give them these amazing culinary experiences every morning. And I like what I mean. I didn't grow up like that. I grew up having great food, but nobody gave so much thought to what I was eating. Like yeah, we did. Are, are your kids foodies or are they kind of picky eaters? Um, it depends on which way the wind blows. So yeah, they are, they're picky sometimes, but they also have like an adventurous streak. You know, they, they eat vegetables quite happily. Uh, we have like, a, we do, well, we start with- Whisperers. So if anyone was going to do something good with vegetables, it's you. But with children, you're never, you, with children, you never know, you know, they can easily be, you know, very picky. They're, they're somewhere in the middle. I find a lot, it's quite difficult with, it's, 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 you, kids are very unpredictable and it's a, eat, what they eat is a kind of indication, is a, often is a power struggle. You know, they say they don't like something without necessarily not liking it. It's a way of exerting power in the you know with the, where they're actually quite powerless you know in the in real life so if they say i don't eat this i normally don't get into a long conversation about it there is i mean what you said about that sort of um the steadying nature of meal times you know i remember when i came over to this country with seven as an immigrant it was that stability of meal times knowing you had a breakfast a lunch and a dinner that literally got you through one day at a time and it was those flavors of home that I found the most comforting. And I think especially now in these sort of dispiriting, mad, panicked times, people more and more are looking uh, to the flavors of home. I know I've been cooking a lot of like dal and sabzi and chapatis and, you know, all the traditional things my mother cooked. What are the kind of, have you been cooking like that? Have you been cooking some more traditional things? Yeah. So I've also been making dal, you'd be happy to hear, and the kids it's love it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, lentil soups and, and, you know, they actually, they're very happy to eat lentils, which is like, even though they're picky, I think even picky kids like a lentil soup, or at least the, the, the ones that are not extremely picky. Uh, so it's a great way to eat, get them to eat well. Um, yeah, I've been cooking all sorts of, my background is, it's kind of a bit of a mongrel back background. So I grew up in a in a kind of, in a family of European immigrants to to Palestine, then Israel. So my mom comes from a German background and my dad from an Italian background. So these two influences, culinary influences, big good culinary influences, were there in my childhood. But also, I guess the overwhelming flavors of my childhood would have been the arab palestinian flavors that i had growing up in in jerusalem which is uh, which is a mixed city of jews and arabs so uh, you know my love of anything hummus related or anything falafel related or shawarmas or all these mezes that are so typical to the middle east the obsession with tahini all those have definitely been um the building blocks of my of my cuisine so actually i can think of of bits of all those 
influences that have been that have featured over the last couple of months here in in lockdown under lockdown so um for one one breakfast i made something very german which is my grand my mother's something's called hopper popple which is essentially it's a user up of potatoes and sausages from potatoes from the previous day which is it's a bit like a, a kind of uh it's a kind of a, a bubble of squ and squeak kind of thing where you take leftovers and yeah hash you put it all together and they absolutely loved it you know fried onion potatoes and sausages with eggs that egg that just binds it so i made that yeah. um but i've also made make majadra for them rice and lentils with fried onion uh, and with a drop of yogurt on top i love that dish i learned when i went to palestine that's one of the dishes i actually we were filming and this lady just came out and was like you must come and eat with us because there is that arab generosity that you know is everywhere and i said okay fine but as long as you teach me what you're cooking and she taught me how to make majadara and it was just it's something i cook all the time now because it's what that one pot thing isn't it which is so useful especially in these times particularly if you have kids what are the other dishes like that that you'd say because a lot of people have been asking actually how do you cook for your children you know mm. I, i've got people saying ah oh, i'm so tired because i'm my ch children's sort of <laughs> syllabus that i'm having to teach is like making me want to hit the gin bottle what can i do that <laughs> is like quick what would you it's, recommend yeah it's very easy to get into a rut with cooking especially when you cook day in day out and i also find myself sometimes opening the fridge and and looking and say oh i'm not going to make that again and they and you know i've published thousands of recipes in my career but for some silly reason only like four come up every time i look at the fridge and i think it's kind of it's almost human nature not to have the imagination the moment you need it so you need to apply yourself i just go often to my old cookbooks and i say okay what should i cook tonight so just like everyone else it's not always easy to to draw up uh, inspiration just like that but things that have been really extremely popular in our house uh, have been fritters so i take things like um, cauliflower a uh, rice mm -hmm. uh, lentils uh, couscous butternut squash all these things and cook them lightly squash them up and mix them up with with the spices that i know that they're going to eat normally the sweet spices like cinnamon or nutmeg or allspice some yeah. chopped up cooked onion an egg to bind it together and this with a yogurt sauce or with a tahini sauce they're always really really happy to have it's never a problem to get them uh, to eat a fritter and this is where people can be super creative because it, it, it's a bit i'm not trying to undermine the effort that goes into a recipe but to create a good a good fritter is uh, is not that difficult you know you just it's need to know forgiving. the texture quite forgiving uh, I, made, um, i made sami's cauliflower fritters for me yes yeah. and they are just so delicious and yeah. I always seem to have a cauliflower sort of languishing at the back of the fridge. So yeah, I agree. It's just one of the lovely things that you can make with a cauliflower that just makes a cauliflower taste so brilliant. Totally. I just to say to people who don't know, all it is is some cooked cauliflower crushed together with with egg and a bit of flour and uh and then it's got cinnamon which is the kind of the key ingredients for me for me in that dish because it gives it a certain sweetness without having to add anything sweet chopped up parsley and some cumin some turmeric and those cauliflower fritters sammy's cauliflower fritters have featured like maybe three or four times over the last couple of months in our house and i i always make double because it really it really heats up really well the next day i make uh, fritters for today fritters for tomorrow and and they eat it over a couple of days and they're Absolutely. super happy you know we have been... my, my very happy memories of of cauliflower my mother used to make this cauliflower curry and you know you just never throw anything away it was cauliflower and peas with like sort of lots of turmeric and cumin and you know maybe a bit of cinnamon and you just never threw anything away the next day so the next day she would smush it into slices of bread and then put it in a breville toaster with lots of butter yeah, and that the turmeric from the cauliflower would sort of seep into that you know fairly cheap white bread with lots of cheese and it was oh, i literally now bad. make that cauliflower curry in order to make those sandwiches <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing 
Um, so we've been doing that. I also make, you know, talking about the rice, uh, you know, the subject of rice because we talked about majadra. I love to do like big baked rice dishes where I take something uh, quite simple like uh, shallots or garlic, tom tomatoes. Um, if it's not vegetarian, you can put bits of meat in it or, or, and cook them slowly in a bit of oil and then put, a pa you know, a cup of rice and uh, some water, seal it up really well with some herbs, like whole sprigs of thyme or whole sprigs of, of mint and stick it in the oven. Mm, yeah. and, 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 re and when it comes out after 25 minutes, half an hour, it's like a meal, but you've, and it's all, it's a meal in one, in one baking dish. And as rice really, that does really benefit from slow keep cooking in the oven because all that steam makes yeah. it really, really light. It's just getting the balance right. But, I've over the years published so many recipes that involve this technique with rice because I absolutely love it. And in simple, there's one there's one recipe that I can't make enough, which is uh, whole cut garlic cloves, maybe I don't know ten or twenty, and then baby shallots and tomatoes, and you put them in with the, quite a bit of olive oil, get yeah. them to kind of confit, which is really just a complicated word for a very slow process that yeah. and a very simple process. Uh, that takes about 20 minutes and then I throw a, 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 a you know a small packet of rice over that water in the oven it's a, it's the most amazing meal to have I love things like that as well and rice is just completely indispensable but anything that you can just sort of chuck in the oven that then takes care of itself and just benefits from sitting in the oven for you know long whether it's a piece of meat or rice but yeah. those rice dishes in particular and all cultures seem to have those dishes, whether it's a paella or a plov or a, you know, biryani or whatever it is, everyone seems to have a version. Yeah, of that. yeah absolutely. Uh, we've mm. also been, you know, I've been also trying to kind of, so again, it's a little bit child focused, but it's also, um, I think it kind of applies to everyone uh, to really kind of work on the, on the pasta, uh, how to make that pasta a bit more nourishing, a bit more uh, interesting every day in, day out. Because it is the first thing that they would ask for, what would you like for lunch, what you want for dinner pasta? I mean, I think they just say what we all want, really. But, you know, kids just don't have that sophistication to, to make, uh, to, to, to say what they don't actually mean. So I've been, so I've been doing this kind of one, one, one pot uh, pasta with uh, with starch, but I've also uh, sorry with uh, with a piece of meat or or chicken. Or, but I've also done yeah. um, nice pasta uh, with a recipe from the uh, New York Times, the Tejal Rao uh, kale pasta, which Helen, you know Helen, I think uh, yeah, Helen yeah, uh, drew my attention to, which is the simplest pesto, but you can get a whole pack of kale into the pasta. Yeah. Uh, it's just boiling kale. And infusing olive oil with some garlic, because as soon as the kale comes off the, the from the boiling pot, which is just five minutes, yeah. you put it in a, in a blender with boiled oil and, and freshly cooked garlic and blitz it, and it's just so fragrant and beautiful, and keeps green in the fridge for days. And then that goes over a pasta with some peas, uh, with feta or without, with pine nuts, with extra basil, whatever you want. It's just it's just the most incredible way to to serve a meal with like zero effort for me really zero effort absolutely and i love i i think i crave i'm slightly anemic so i always crave those very green things i actually had a uh, pasta with chimi the other uh, other day and it was just just with garlic olive oil a little bit of chili and that's it it was just yeah. a bit of lemon zest at the end really really delicious i love things like that we have a dish which i i think you would absolutely love and i was describing it to my husband and saying it's like my two favorite things that have been combined so it's dal uh, with it's called dal dofi and it comes from Gujarat and it's like a pasta which is made out of chapati flour and uh, chickpea flour you make a really soft dough and you put some uh, spices in there some chili powder and you roll it out and you cut it in little diamond shapes and then you make a dal like it's quite a sort of a liquid dal and then you basically pop those diamonds of that chapati pasta. Oh my gosh, that dal. sounds so good. And you let it cook for about 15 minutes till it's still quite al dente. And then you eat that with sort of chopped onions and peanuts. And it is just oh. 
nourishing divine one pot dinner i love it i'll make it for you one day oh yes please or i'll make it myself if we don't see each other before just ping me the, the ping recipe, the recipe yeah for sure so i was going to say you you have been really responsible for bringing complete exuberance to people's pantries by popularizing ingredients like tahini and za'atar what would you say are the sort of key magical ingredients that take dishes from basic to brilliant well i think there is a there is a bunch of those and i i i I, I don't mind repeating myself to an audience that I can't see. I mean, if I see them, then I feel quite bad that I've, maybe I've said something before, but all I can see is you, which is a good thing. But, you know, the, what I love about the food of, of the Middle East, uh, the, the, the food uh, around the, the Fertile Crescent, you know, Palestinian, Lebanese, Syrian, Israeli, is that there is a, it's, a, it's not a very labor-intensive kind of food. When I look at the food in India, I always think, oh, there's so much more that goes in before you can actually get what, you know, a good meal, you know, the, the, uh, there's quite a lot of chopping and pounding and, and, and yeah, you know. yeah. So there is a, there is a key, a, there's a key a set of ingredients that are really powerful in, in these cuisines. And like you mentioned, mm. um, tahini, which I think just kind of elevates things. And, and like you have in uh, all over the world, yogurt and the combination of tahini and yogurt either mm. together or separately, those things, when you know how to introduce them into a meal, have an incredible power of elevating. And they're not like groundbreaking. They're not like inventions that I haven't created them or discovered them, but they've, they've always been there. But the idea that you can introduce tahini and you can use your, you can introduce yogurt to various stages, either off the cooking or the presentation of the serving, is a, is a real magical ability to do this. And you know, we were talking about the majadra, we were talking about the the um, the cauliflower fritters. All these great things are really ele elevated by a great sauce. And you know, the great sauce is literally rich, thick yogurt. A squeeze of lime or lemon juice, and maybe a, a, a you know a sprinkle of cumin or cardamom, and a, a drizzle of olive oil. I mean, the, the the yogurt is the main thing, but you can dress it and elevate it in so many wonderful ways. And and so those are really two key ingredients. There are uh, certain spices that I think are. I've, I mean, I've, I've because I've I kind of always i'm always for the lookout for new on the lookout for new things i've always fallen in love with new things at the moment uh, i've got the focus of this ne next book that's coming is uh, in many ways it's chili so we've got let's get i've got this kind of chili renaissance with all kind of chili condiments chili oils of a mexican background or a middle eastern background and chili sauces and all the rest a good chili sauce or a good, good chili oil, and you only need one in your pantry, one that you make really well or two, yeah. is a really massive elevator of a good meal. It's I mean, transformative, it's really transformative. I've made, um, I've made um, since I've came here, I mean, I've come and made like these quick shatas, kind of Palestinian chili sauces that I really yeah. make in minutes. It's, it's all it is is chilies and salt and a bit of vinegar or lemon juice and a bit of oil. I mean, that's all that goes into them. I love them. Um, I particularly love like the Asian chili oil that you like. I love to make congee and just to have congee with ch chili oil drizzled over it is just, I mean, totally. the best we pop call ever. Totally. It's chili oil or a good sambal, you know, these things oh, yeah. they're just great and like i say there is this kind of range of input or effort that you need to put from the very simple ones to the more complicated ones but they have a really a real transformative power and um, the other one that i've been speaking a lot about is lemon and all its der derivative you know preserved lemon dried lemon dried limes all you know that it's just one fruit or one family of fruits but they really keep on giving. I mean, I just, I carry on discovering how wonderful lemons and limes are. And again, it's about your infusing oil with a skin or it's about roasting the thing and, and taking the, the, the brown flesh and using it in a dish. It's about slow cooking or quick cooking. It's about a, a simple squeeze of, of the juice. I mean, there's just endless things that you can do. And this is an incredible, citrus has the most incredible transformative power yes, in I food. It's, really. my, it's my hero thing. I love citrus. I have such a, I love anything sour actually from sumac to tamarind to lemons, all those sharp things. I yeah. love, 
I'm really, I'm particularly obsessed at the moment with using um, like Indian lemon pickle and I blitz it maybe with a tiny bit of ginger if it needs it and putting it into a butter and then either using that as a marinade for prawns or like you could even do yogurt if you didn't want to do butter, oh, but wow. making a marinade. But that particularly with butter on carrots mm. is like transformative. Like it completely elevates carrots in a really wonderful way i need to write it to i'm writing notes to self <laughs> lemon pickle with butter for carrots <laughs> um you know what are the kind of lesser ingredients that you think are going to be the next big thing is there anything that you're really excited i know you said chilies but is there anything anywhere you've traveled recently where you've picked up something and gone wow this is just um, the last place I was in uh, was in uh, California, and then there were lots of chilies, Mexican chilies, cascabel chilies, and the anchos. Uh, and I, I do find that Mexican chilies have got massive potential to kind of infuse so many, so many kinds of food. And I've, I have discovered that it really isn't about the heat. The heat is a kind of a is it something that's there? But there's all these other layers of flavors that chili bring, chilies bring with them. Uh, those are definitely new greens. I've been using more and more. In my test kitchen, I've got a colleague, colleague called Noor Murad, and she's from Bahrain. And she's been yeah. using a lot of Omani lime, you know, the, the dried lime from, from, uh, yeah. from uh, the, the, the Gulf and, and Iran. Uh, a really incredibly effective ingredient to be using it. That was a real revelation to me, actually. And recently, I bought something which is, again, a derivative of the dried lime. I haven't used it yet, probably because I don't know how, and I haven't really seen any recipes which use it. But it's the powder. So how would you yeah. use the powder? Yeah, well, the powder, it, it's kind of in the same way. So you can use the powder um, and add it to other things, like to sauces, to like a yogurt sauce or, or, or things like that. And then it adds that... You know, but you need to use it sparsely. It's quite intense. Uh, so you, you put a little bit in and see how that works. But you can also use it as a finishing. Like when you roast, you, when you want to get like the crust on your chicken, and you do like coarse salt and you rub that in and you put a little bit of that, it would give you an incredible crispy, tangy skin on your chicken or your lamb. I mean, I think that would be, uh, those would be good uses for that. Uh, but I really, really love it with, um, with greens, like with, uh, with, uh, yeah, uh, with yeah. the greens, with the cavallo nero, with any, any green with uh, spinach. I mean, Noor, again, she kind of taught me how to introduce it to, to greens because, you know, sl slow cooked or quick cook cooked greens are just so vibrant. And when you add that kind of drop of, of lemony thing, and you can use the powder for that, no problem. So you would just finish with it at the end? Yeah, you can finish with it at the end and just put as much as you think it will take and serve that with rice, with saffron rice or any 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 kind of great rice and it's, it really is transformative. So when I um, when I in, uh, announced that I was doing this interview, I had, you know, loads of people uh, sending me messages with lots of questions. So I'm going to sort of share the love and, and ask yeah. some of these questions. So I have a baking question here and it's from Anissa in St. John's Wood who says are there any really forgiving bakes that I can make that don't actually have flour because of course there are all these people by making sourdough and it's running out everywhere and she's like I can't get flour what's a forgiving bake without flour what would you recommend uh, so I one of the things that you could do is flatbreads using chickpea flour. So if you can get chickpea flour, which I think is probably, you, I find that in, in British supermarkets, you you go to the kind of the main aisle and you look for your basmati rice and they completely run out. And then you go to the kind of ethnic aisle, which, you yes. could, you know, which has all the stuff that people that are having grown up in this country eat. And it's full of all the, every possible rice, but they just don't even walk down that aisle. You know, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. So, um, so chickpea flour is a great way to make um, flatbreads, really nice, interesting flatbreads. I've been um, yeah, um, from, from Northern Italy and Southern France, uh, farinata, and it's derivatives. It's really simple. It's olive oil based, uh, and it creates a really crisp kind of uh, thing. And, and I know in, in Indian cooking, there is an equivalent. Uh, 
Yeah, so this this is definitely some, a, a way to get around not using flour. When she when she says bakes, I assume she means savory, but there's a whole lot of cakes that you use um, flourless cakes. You know, you know, using um, almond meal um, or any other nut meal, uh, all kind of great ways to, to bake. Um, breads, I guess, again, the substitute flours are not immediate. You need to kind of follow a recipe. I always find that, I mean, it's not me, it's, it's just the thing. I mean, with baking, you really need to first follow a recipe. But there's a lot online, and I really do recommend the alternative flours, the rice flour, chickpea flour. Um, they're, they're very good for these. Have there, has there been anything that you've particularly been longing for that, you know, they, that has been sort of out because of a shortage? Anything you haven't been able to get your mitts on? Um, well, I, I, find that, I find that there is actually more to, to get than, 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 than you'd think. Uh, so if you queue long enough, you, you normally can get anything you want. The one thing that is really hard to get is yeast. Uh, I think yeast is the one product that is, I consistently couldn't find on the shelf, and um, I do, I do not, for my sins, have a have a sourdough starter in my at home, which is I should have um, probably thought about it. Or I find it really peculiar that people are naming their sourdough starters. There's a, there's a <laughs> somewhere a Janet in another. <laughs> Yeah, no, I guess you develop a relationship with your starter because you nourish it as if it was a member of your family. You carry on feeding it. It's very, I, th I think people do use the kind of the family metaphors. I mean, there's the mother, the mother dough and the mother starter and all the rest. So, um, oh, hello. We've got a friend. Hello. Is that Lynn or Max? <laughs> That's Max. That's Max. Hi, Max. Um, <laughs> so, um, Max, come on. Let me just finish here, okay? <laughs> Max, <laughs> Max, please. I'll come later, okay? I'll come later. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I love um, that video. So, uh, the kids have been uh, photobombing every possible Zoom meeting that I have, including this now. This um, awesome. I'm going to get Nadim in in a second. He can photobomb <laughs> me. I don't have the kids yet. <laughs> Uh, so what were we talking about? We were talking about, oh, actually, you know what, on to another thing. It, okay. I, this is, you know, a special day for many reasons. One, which I'm sure a date that you've had in your diary for a long, long time. It's National Hummus Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it today? So lots of people have been asking uh, what, you know, what makes the perfect hummus? Can you talk us through a recipe of how do you do it? Uh, okay, uh, you know, I was quite a hummus fanatic and now I've become much more forgiving. With okay. the, I don't think it's the age, I don't think it's the kind of the distance from the part of the world where I grew up, where I learned, you know, all about hummus. So there is a there is a very st traditional recipe that I uh, follow that Sami and I published in our book Jerusalem, uh, which involves um, as soaking obviously soaking the chickpeas in water overnight. You need you, you so it's not not, tins. This recipe I'll move on to tins in a second. Okay. Uh, this involves uh, soaking uh, dried chickpeas overnight. And then uh, cooking them in a pot with a bit of bake, uh, baking soda to break down the skins dry without even adding the water. And then adding the water and cooking until very, very soft. And then some of the skins float to the surface and you skim that. For a very smooth hummus, you want to get rid of at least some of the skin. Some people peel, which is another option, but that's quite a lot of work. And then it's got a good quality tahini, uh, garlic, lemon juice, and salt, and water. I mean, that's that's all there is, and that's a that's a very traditional and very good recipe, and I love that. But now I've become a bit more forgiving, and uh, I'm happy for people to use uh, ready cooked chickpeas. I think the run of the mill tin is not great, but there's I, I, if you can afford and you can find the premium chickpeas that come from in jars and from Spanish or Portuguese uh, brands. They're really, really good. They're really soft and flavorsome. And they do make a good hummus, I have to say. And, and I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't um, criticize anyone who uses those. I think they're almost as good as this. And then also with a kind of, so I, I used to think, you know, only tahini, but actually tahini and, and olive oil 
still work. So you can make an olive oil based, based uh, chickpea. I mean, I've, I've, I've become much more uh, lenient towards people's variation because I also now, especially at the moment, there's such, it's such a good time to, to be experimenting and we, c we just don't have the luxury of having every ingredient on the face of the yeah. planet in our, in our pantry. What are your thoughts on all these like uh, flavored tahinis? I've seen everything from turmeric tahini to this tahini to that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that I don't really like. It's a bit like flavored cheese. It's a bit like yeah. uh, infused oil. I mean, if you want to do that, do it in your own kitchen and do it in a kind of a in a in a in a thoughtful way. But I don't see the point of getting things that have been kind of made up for you because there's no reason for it. I mean, they're just you know those are basic ingredients and they're just so good as they are, and they don't really need any adorations or additions or anything yeah. like that. You know, talking of uh, hummus and tahini, which is obviously an integral part of a hummus, a friend of mine, Natalie, who's in Bristol, uh, says that she loves tahini, but some of the ones that she's bought in the past can taste quite rancid or bitter. What's your favorite brand and what should one look out for when buying tahini? Yeah, well, first of all, when it comes to tahini, um, I think it really depends on, it needs to be, um, you, the best sesame seeds come from Ethiopia and those and, and be very well toasted. So the brands of tahini that I normally use are Lebanese, Palestinians or Israeli because in that part of the world there is kind of a long tradition of an appreciation of those particular sesame seeds and the processes of toasting them and grinding them. They are really, it's a bit like, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, in most supermarket shelves, in the UK, the standard tahini comes from uh, Greece or Cyprus. Um, without being judgmental, that's not my favorite ones. They don't have the flavor. Uh, so yeah. it's a case of tasting. And, and tahini, once you've opened it, you need to use it for, for, fairly quickly because it does tend to get uh, rancid. Um, but nobody should be um, uh, put off by the fact that it splits to liquid and solids in the jar or in the tub because that's just the natural thing. Once you stir it, they come back together. Yeah, and what's the best? Do you, do you tend to warm it up? Because sometimes it's really, really quite solid and just stirring it sometimes you're- I don't think it. it needs to warm up. You just need a firm hand and yeah. stir it very, very vigorously. So the solids and the, and the, and the liquid and the oils mix up together. And uh, when you make it, there is a kind of a leap of faith moment where you have to start adding your liquids and then it sets and, and kind of uh, pulls together and you yeah. think, oh, something has gone wrong, but you need to pass that stage and carry on adding your water and then you get that kind of loose, creamy uh, texture. I think with tahini, it's really a matter of kind of learning how to know. A lot of people, when you, they use it the first time and try it the first time, they don't need know exactly what to expect, but once you've known it, it's so easy easy to get addicted to it. It's just yeah, a wonderful I thing. I love it on toast. You know, it's such a good snack. Yeah. And actually talking of snacks, you know, obviously this time where everyone needs comfort, I think everyone's been, I've been overeating quite a bit, um, but everyone's snacking. What's your kind of go-to snack? What do you have in your treats cupboard? <laughs> uh, my go-to snack. So I, I'm, I'm addicted to nuts. You know, I love nuts. And I can eat them just plain raw. And it, often in the evening when I sit in front of the TV and watch something, I get a glass of wine and, and almonds or pistachios, and I can really have them whichever way they come. I'm very happy with that. But um, I also obviously like to roast them and cook them with spices. I love rosemary nuts. Uh, so, a bun, a, you know, a tray of nuts of various kinds mixed with a couple of sprigs of ro rosemary, a tiny bit of oil, a little bit of uh, garlic, and just in the oven with salt, and you get that kind of rosemary flavor. That's almost as much as as you'll need, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's good, and it's it's very good for you. Yeah, I love I love any kind of you know anything that gives that kind of crunch to you know that you can take by the handful is lovely. Yeah. We do um a really we did a really nice uh, nut thing in in at Jikoni where we were doing it was quite uh, labor intensive uh, because we were getting lime leaves and then um, taking the stalks out, deep frying the lime leaves. Um, and then making a powder out of those and mixing with chili and uh, oh, mandarin zest 
and then baking the um, nuts with that. And that, again, the fragrance and, I mean, addictive, you know, you just couldn't stop. So I stopped making them now because I just kept yeah. eating the whole stock. Um, but, um, you know, a good, good snack, of course, needs a, a great drink. And Aisha in Kingston wants to know, what is Otto Lenghi's lockdown tipple? You don't have to say how many you have. <laughs> Uh, so I like vodka and tonic it's something that I you know with a squeeze of lime it's a, it's yeah. definitely something uh, that I have the job I really do love a good Negroni uh, uh, the only problem that I find is that I find it very difficult to stop it, literally I can have them one after the other because of the sugar level it's just it's just something that you do more often than not I got a good Italian red wine and that's what I have until, you know, you know, I can easily go through half a bottle or more, you know, in, at the end of the day. And I have no problem with that. And um, I, try to, I try to have a bit less now because you need to be a bit more focused and, you know, family time. But, yeah, a good, a good, um, a, a good uh, multi Pugiano or some, some good Italian wine, I'm, I'm sorted. I'm like you. I'm with you on the Negronis. I love them. And also because they're so easy to make because it's always three parts of, you know, those yeah. wonderful things. And I like that they, they taste um, slightly medicinal, <laughs> like they're good for you. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, but, you know, Yotam, we both come from fairly similar cultures in that we, we both come from kitchens that were probably, um, you know, very frugal, very resourceful. Are there those kinds of things that you've picked up from your, that have been passed down from your maternal family that you still put into practice today? Um, let me think. Um, yeah, one of the things that we uh, ate a fair amount, my I have in Jerusalem a recipe passed on from my mother, stuffed peppers. And one of the things that I have had a lot growing up, I, I do it less now because it is labor intensive and often to put the meal on the table, you just don't take the time. But stuffed vegetables are a wonderful thing to, to do. And my mother makes stuffed red peppers and uh, with, with uh, either just with rice and, 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 and flavorings or with rice and a bit of minced meat. Mm. And it's, uh, again, it's something that is very cross-cultural uh, around the, the, middle, the Middle East, North Africa and the Southern Mediterranean. And uh, it's, a, it's a great use, it's a great way to make a, a really lavish meal uh, with very humble ingredients because you have your vegetable and you have your cheap starches, you know, whether you use bulgur wheat or rice and a tiny bit of meat if you want to. And it creates a whole very, very um, um, impressive meal that is just fantastic to, to serve. So that's definitely something that, I, that I've kind of taken on from, from childhood. I think um, we're, we're sort of slightly running out of time. I could talk to you all day, really, I could. Um, but I wanted to touch on your book, which you kind of talked about already, um, about the chilies. Is there, what else can we look forward to from, from that book? Flavor. Uh, so Flavor is a vegetable cookbook. Great. And again, it focuses on, on the world of vegetables. When I say vegetables, you know, it's vegetables and grains. And um, it will have a it will have a slightly Italian angle, it will have a slightly Mexican angle. Again, it's like a, with a big with a big mix of flavors that I I love using. And uh, it's it, we've given a lot of thought to to this book, and it's it's uh, it which I try to understand through the recipe with my co-author Esther Belfridge, who's who's um, who is an incredible cook herself. And uh, she and I have been trying to think: How do you, uh, what, uh, how do you create, create flavor bombs in in in, in veg with vegetables? So there's three uh, key sections. One is about processes. The other is about pairing, and the other is called produce. So the three P. And through each one, we kind of explore uh, how you inf you you uh, kind of load vegetables with with flavors and there's like really cool nifty little tricks and more complicated things that go on but lots of exciting vegetable dishes to look forward to in the, in September. I love all those nifty little uh, vegetable, I mean all your nifty little tricks, they're always so <laughs> useful. I have one more question before I, I, I get to questions from the audience. 
But, um, you know, you've done so much in your life, Yotam, you know, philosophy, journalism, chefing, restauranteuring. Can we expect a memoir one day? <laughs> and it, that is something that I still, I don't, I don't think I'm ready to, uh, to write a memoir. I, you know what, the one, the one, I, I might regret saying that and I will regret and I will write a memoir one day, but I just feel that I've been writing so much about myself in the context of food that I've kind of exhausted all my memories that I don't know where I'm going to draw more memories on that maybe I'll just have to do with non-food related memories, but I've well, just written so much over the years. Yeah. You have to make the memories. So let me, let me get to some of these uh, lovely audience um, questions. So, uh, Here's one. Um, as a cook in a, this is from. Oh, it's a private uh, question. Um, as a cook in the current pandemic situations, how do you feel about grow your food movement? Um, how do you feel about growing yeah, your? Do you have a garden patch? I don't have a garden patch, but uh, I think it's really it's a great thing to do. I think one of the things that I've noticed in in during this lockdown and. And there has been initiatives, and many of the chefs that work in my restaurant have been doing it, uh, is that, that people are out in their gardens uh, growing vegetables. And it is a wonderful way to connect with your ingredients. Uh, then Dan Barber from, uh, from uh, Stone Barn in, in New York has started this movement that really encourages chefs in front of house uh, people from restaurant to go out and, and grow vegetables just in honor of all the farmers that are actually struggling at the moment because they've, you know, they've, they, they are, the sustainable small farms that have been supplying so many of the restaurants are really struggling at the moment because we're closed and people look at empty restaurants and they think, oh, poor, you know, that's not great for the, for the community, but actually there's a whole ecosystem of suppliers and farmers and cleaners and IT and all those people that like really feed those. Right? Yeah. Like all the humanity that goes behind all, it. Exactly. All the humanity that goes into it. So, so you know, I think it's really important for chefs that that, that idea that Dan Barber had to kind of remind ourselves that these farmers and I put so much effort into big, and, you know, big agriculture will always survive, but they, 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 the, uh, the innovators and the small farmers that produce great, uh, pro crops for us are really struggling at the moment. So it's, it's important to remember them and planting something in your own garden is a great, is a great way to, to remember this. And one, one final question and seeing as this is a literary uh, festival, uh, Thej Ravel asks, I'm trying to get into food writing, but really struggle to articulate myself when it comes to food. Are there any exercises you would uh, recommend to help writing? Um, really good question. I mean, I've, I've, I've done food writing, I'm given food writing workshops in my, in the past and, and one, and so I've given it some thought. I think the, it's very important to, um, to experience. I think first experience, then write. I think it's really important to gather those experiences because a rich experience will give you materials to write about. Um, the other thing is to, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a cliche, but you really need to be 100% true to yourself because you, you're never going to be a good food writer if you're trying to emulate someone else's style or, or their kind of writing. I think it's, it, it needs to come from very deep down inside. It needs to be kind of overflow, you know, from experiences for things. That, those are the kind of foods you need to feed your writing because otherwise it just, it's very, it could be quite shallow. So you know, go out, experience, thing. you know, have these kind of in, in, incredible, um, uh, you know, riveting uh, life experience through food, and that will probably translate itself to, to good writing. Well, thank you so much, Yotam. It, this has really been the highlight of my lockdown <laughs> chat with you, and I'm very much looking forward to coming and eating in your restaurants, God willing, when the lockdown is over. Ravinder, thank you. And thank you for creating this incredible restaurant, Chikoni, which I have to say is really, you know, I love the atmosphere there. We were talking about restaurants, but not just about the food, they're about the atmosphere. It really is a, a projection of your spirit and uh, through food, through service, through decor, 
and I can't wait for the day that I'll uh, I'll be back there and hopefully soon, hopefully yeah. in this this July. I hope so. Lots of love. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Your love time, Raghinder. I do I don't know about our, the rest of our viewers, but I think everybody's going to be rushing to their kitchens to sort of pick up some of what both of you have been telling us about the cauliflower and the cheap white bread with the cheese or the drizzling <laughs> olive oil on the chickpeas overnight, etc. Absolutely delicious. And thank you all for watching and being such a brilliant audience. And thank you for all the comments uh, that you put onto our pages. Sorry we couldn't take any of your questions. But do remember to log back on for our next session of JLF's Brave New World Redux series. On behalf of Namitha Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Team Vocats, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. Our magazine partner for this series is the week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Even as we've completed over 110 episodes with 3.4 million views or thereabouts, it is our endeavor to replay some of our very special sessions, which you may have missed as part of this ongoing series, JLF Brave New World's Redux. Our second session for the day is Otto Lange's Lockdown Kitchen. With his fabulous restaurants and best-selling Otto Lange cookbooks, Yotam Otto Lange has established himself as one of the most exciting talents in the world of cookery and food writing. Not a vegetarian himself, his approach to vegetable dishes is wholly original and innovative based on strong flavors and stunning fresh combinations. Here he talks to award-winning food writer and chef Ravinder Bhogal about his life and work and what we should be doing uh, in terms of cooking to keep sane during the lockdown. Yotam Otolangi is a cookery writer and chef patron of the Otolangi Delis, Papi and Rovi restaurants. He writes a weekly column in the Guardian's Feast magazine, a monthly column in the New Yorker, and has published seven best-selling cookbooks. His 2018 award-winning book is Otto Lange Simple with Tara Wigley and Esma Howard. His latest cookbook, Flavor, will be published in September 2020. <clears throat> Ravinder Bhogal is an award-winning journalist, restauranter, chef, and broadcaster. In 2016, she opened her first restaurant, Shikoni, gaining a place in the National Restaurant Awards within six months of opening. Her debut book, Cook in Boots won the Gooman World Cookbook Award for the UK's best first cookbook. Her latest book is Jaconi, proudly inauthentic recipes from an immigrant's kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, Ravinder Bhokal and Yotam Otolengi, please do remember to comment and ask questions 
by typing it into the comment section. Do also follow our handle GLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. And in case any of you drop off due to bad bandwidth issues, or in case we drop off, we promise to be back. Or you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF, or of course, on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, Otolengi's Lockdown Kitchen. Hi, Yotam. It's so lovely to see you. Good to see you too, Ravinder. It's a, it's a special occasion. Welcome uh, to the Jaipur Literary Festival in my humble dining room. <laughs> far, far away from the magnificent palaces of Jaipur. How was your commute to your living room? <laughs> it was very easy. Uh, but I was on the phone with a friend and I said, you know what we are doing now? I'm going to the Jaipur Literary Festival. She said, lucky you. And um, yeah, all I had to move is from the bed to the uh, to this corner of the room to uh, to do this, which is kind of magical. But believe me, I would have much rather be to Jaipur right now. <laughs> me too. Well, hopefully when lockdown is over, one day we'll be in Jaipur doing this. Yeah. I'm so thrilled. You know, I'm a huge, huge Ottolenghi fan, um, you know, and I'm just so utterly thrilled to be chatting to you today. You know, you don't need an introduction, uh, but in case anybody has been living under a rock for the past 20 years, I'll go ahead and introduce you anyway. And I've got my papers, so I'm feeling very official. So you're I'm sure to... I don't blush too much. Oh, <laughs> Yokomoto Lengi is the undisputed king of cookery one of the most influential chefs of our times and someone I am hugely personally indebted to because over the years I have found so much inspiration in your time in reading your columns, your books, um, reading your recipes, cooking them and of course eating at your stunning restaurants. You have really revolutionized how we cook, how we choose 